em maio, no fruto né, da nova areia, o pontuado de sair de baixo, né, com o pontual da Holanda, a partir do Oeste, que é o que está no ponto de banho. É lá, é lá, é lá agora. A partir do ponto de banho, com o pontuado, né, de novo, o que eu não conheci. É ainda não, mas a gente tem uma relação, uma parceria muito grande, conseguimos fazer muitas atividades aqui e trazer também convidados de terra. E hoje, especialmente, estamos contentes de ter entre nós o Eric Jegoy. I don't know if I am, I am pronouncing it well. It's good enough. É, ele vai fazer a palestra dele em inglês. Problema nenhum, mas se tem algum comentário, alguma coisa que não está parada, ou alguma questão, ou alguma pergunta que vocês querem fazer, não tem nem como para fazer em inglês, a Patrícia pode ajudar uh, na parte de demanda de, de, de perguntas e, e respostas. Né, depois da, 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 da palestra. O, o Eric, o arquiteto, arquiteto com, ainda tem, parece muito novo, mas ele tem um grande percurso, uma grande trajetória internacional, hoje vai falar com a gente de materialidade e tecnologia na arquitetura. E ele tem um exemplo, um exemplo muito interessante de como novos materiais e a tecnologia podem ser grandes aliados da arquitetura e da nova arquitetura. Tem uma arquitetura não somente esteticamente válida, mas, como eu digo, eficiente, o que quer dizer sustentável. Né? Sustentabilidade eficiente, sustentabilidade, são duas palavras que, pelo menos aqui no IEF, querem dizer a mesma coisa e tem a ver com tecnologia, tecnologia e meio tecnologia e novos materiais. Ele vai trazer exemplos interessantes, é, concreta, que ele completamente desenvolveu, tem uma parte fantástica sobre é, construção com sal, material mais vai explicar para a gente como resolveram essa questão e, sobretudo, como é que são trilhos de concreto sustentável. Ele desenvolveu uma carreira grossamente de empresas, uma especialmente vinculada à questão do sal, mas o grande start, o grande mudança para ele foi na experiência dele na China. A China, vocês sabem, que tem parte de um país imenso, tem um desenvolvimento, ele está tendo um desenvolvimento a industrial, mas sobretudo arquitetônico muito grande e muito impactante. Então, realmente, ele entendeu qual, quais são os problemas desse país e como a arquitetura é, com novas tecnologias e novos materiais pode ser uma grande parceira, uma grande aliada no desenvolvimento sustentável. Então, on you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Fabio. Oh, that was a permissive presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, it's nice to be here. In a beautiful location, also. Um, so I'm going to talk about two projects we're we're working on in in Holland. Uh, I'll start a bit with telling about myself. I think Fabio covered uh, uh, most of it. But indeed, I'm an architect. I studied in uh, in in Delft, and uh, when I was studying, the the crisis hit, uh, and there were no jobs. So at that time, I thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to not work in Holland, but work in China. So I moved to, to China to, to work there as an architect. Um, so I ended up, let's see if this works. <laughs> Look it up. So I ended up working in uh, a small city called Xiamen, five million people uh, in, in China. And um, I was working for a, a Dutch architecture company or urbanism company, so doing mostly uh, master plan city extensions. Uh, and, and my job there was to be a kind of business developer slash designer for them. So every time there was a new project or a new lead, I would go to, to the location, I would talk to the people and kind of be the sort of, well, simply said, the white person in China for them. Um, and it was kind of an interesting job because it led me to kind of the edge of cities in China and really the edge of expansion in China. And you see there, in, in areas like this, for example, um, the impact that large-scale construction has on, on landscape, on people, on, uh, on nature. Uh, you see sort of impact of, of this you know, massive concrete, steel, pollution uh, that, that it generates. And um, you know, this, this was quite close to my house. It used to be sort of beautiful, uh, simple harbor, and then they decided to build 
you know, a couple 200 meter high towers next to it, uh, completely ruining everything. So for me, sort of working there for, for about a year, uh, sort of thinking about, you know, how can we make an architecture that is less impactful, that is less about, you know, these sort of quite polluting materials as, as concrete and steel. So I went back to school uh, and started working on, as a, first as a graduation thesis on on, on this project, uh, the SALT project. Uh, and that's a project, well, SALT is a, is a really interesting material historically. Um, SALT used to be a very valuable material. You know, the, the word, it was used to, to conserve food, for example. The word salary comes from salt. Uh, the, the first road to Rome came from the salt fields to, to, to the city, the Via Salaria. Um, so it used to be very valuable material. And even, you know, Timbuktu made his riches from, from salt by the, the caravans transporting salt from the desert. And it's this kind of unique, sort of very wide, quite beautiful material, but the the value of that material has been changing and it's been sort of changing from uh, a material that used to be in demand and, and, and valuable to something that is uh, harvested on an extremely industrial scale and of which there is now almost an excess uh, in fact it's so cheap it's like eleven dollars a ton so it's, uh, it's worth nothing basically it's the same price as sand so this is how salt is being harvested right now. I think this is in the San Francisco Bay. Um, basically, they have pump in seawater and let it slowly evaporate through a series of uh, uh, ponds in which these kind of cool, beautiful uh, uh, pink algae grow. It gets really Martian, alien, alien landscapes uh, almost. This is really unique. Um, but the disadvantage of the salt being so cheap is that it's now becoming a, a waste material. Um, one place in which this is obvious is, is Israel in, in the Dead Sea, where there, uh, you see on the bottom, you know, this is this sort of company called the Dead Sea Works, slowly expanding over the years. Uh, in the Dead Sea, there's a lot of different salts, lithium salt, potassium salt, and also sodium salt, which is normal kitchen salt. So here they harvest the lithium and the potassium, the sodium salt is worth nothing, and they discard it, throw it back into the desert. Uh, which is not very good because um, it doesn't grow anything. This is in a, an area in in France, in south of France, in the Camargue. Uh, they're also they've been harvesting salt here for two thousand years, I think, since since Roman times. And um, what's really interesting is that in 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 this area, at least the the salt fields, it has created a kind of ecosystem. So there's Tons of birds. I mean, the, the fields are full of, you know, you see the pink algae. It's full of little shrimp, full of algae. And over the, you know, the 2,000 years it's been existing, it's attracted all kinds of birds, all kinds of uh, other wildlife and nature. And it's created a kind of delicate ecosystem. And, and what's happening now is that salt they're harvesting is generally salt to de ice the roads and the Alps. That is their sort of region. And now winters are getting warmer. They can't sell as much salt. Their whole company is shrinking. And with that, affecting all the food sources for the, the wildlife in the area. And, and finally, the sort of main issue related to, uh, to this material is from desalination. Uh, so basically turning seawater into fresh water. Um, this is an image of the, the Persian Gulf. So the area between Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Dubai. All these uh, cities and countries use uh, seawater to, you know, as drinking water. So they desalinate it, and in this process, you take in seawater, separate it into fresh water and very salty water, and put the salty water back into the ocean. Salty water is heavy, flows to the bottom, ruins the ecosystem, and they've been doing it on on such a scale that actually their uh, level of salt in that sea is kind of closed off, has been increasing. Um, and when you increase the level of salt, less and less uh, wildlife can, can support it. Less fish, less plants, less uh, invertebrates. And that is really an issue because also the saltier the water is, the more expensive it is to make drinking water out of it. So it's not only a, a sort of environmental issue, but in this case, an uh, economical issue. Um, and you know the scale of this is, is so big. Um, 
you know, that we should think of of using this salt for something else than you know putting it on your eggs and uh, and, and doing those kind of things. Maybe and and this is a kind of academic uh, a thing I, I was working on when I was in, in school. Maybe we should turn it into cities. You know, it's it's so much of it, millions and millions of tons. Um, uh, so maybe we should turn this into a kind of salt architecture. So that was the kind of starting point um, for me uh, a couple of years ago to sort of figure out, you know, what would that be? Would that be possible? Um, what would it look like? And and sort of what? How how do you do that? Um, so I started off by making. Uh, Basically, in my kitchen at home, some uh, some some salt bricks. <laughs> um, in this case, you know, there's there's a lot of things you can do with with salt. You can uh, you can grow the crystals. It's quite fragile. Um, you can um, press them into blocks, very heavy blocks that melt quite easily. Uh, you can melt it even in a in a ceramic oven and sort of melt the salt into a liquid. Add ceramic stuff to it, make tiles. And in this case, uh, it's a kind of composite. So it's a, mainly a starch and a salt that is then finished uh, to create a kind of salt uh, brick. Um, so you cast it in a, in a mold, it dries out, and it's, it's super strong, actually. It's, it's almost like a marble. Um, so these were kind of the first results. And this is pretty encouraging, you know? It's, it's not this, but it's, it's something. Um, and so I graduated. I mean, this was my my graduation thesis, a kind of research of what salt architecture could could look like. Um, this is the this is very small scale. And and at the time, I had a kind of simple brick salt material, and no money, so not enough money to build that city with those bricks. Uh, so I thought, well, I have enough money to not make a architecture or a house, but I can do. Uh, a kind of chair or a kind of design object from this material, and see where uh, where we can take it. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe we can even so maybe I can experiment with this a bit more because it's kind of early stage. Um, you know, why not make a kind of series of of chairs using different uh, uh, salt recipes in this case, so different uh, reinforcements, different colorings, different uh, ratios of ingredients, and kind of see. What are the different properties you can you can reach with this stuff? Um, so I built a kind of a salt oven. You can see it in the back. It's all super DIY, but it was a, a kind of I needed a box that would dry out the salt um, at about seventy degrees, and then here is the mold of the the chair. And basically how it works is you you mix the, the salt, the starch, all the other stuff you want to mix uh, together. You add exactly the right amount of water so that it dries out perfectly. Uh, that creates a kind of wet, what's it called, a non-Newtonian fluid. That you can cast in, in a mold. Uh, and then very slowly, on on quite low temperature, like 70 degrees, you can, you can dry it out. Um, in this case, in this very DIY salt oven. So then after about a, well, a couple of days of, of drying, you uh, release the mold. And you know you let it air dry a bit. And what it gives you is a kind of really a marble-like material. It's quite beautiful. It's very strong. It's a similar strength as, uh, as concrete, uh, non-reinforced, and uh, a very be quite beautiful white, uh, white look. Uh, can give you, and then you can waterproof it with a finishing, and uh, you know costs are very low. So this was the first kind of salt chair. Here, there's a second one. This one has a. Uh, they're all photos in in the workshop. I thought it'd be fun to show the production process. Uh, so this is the a chair with a, a, a reinforcement fiber in it. It's a really cool property of the the salt. So you can't put like normally you would reinforce a structure with metal that you know it rusts completely with with the salt. So you have to think of other ways to reinforce uh, it. And, and what's cool about salt is that it conserves organic fibers. So in this case, this is a, a coconut fiber reinforced uh, a chair that is then 
uh, even stronger than the, the regular one. No, and that sort of went to to a few exhibitions, uh, Dutch Design Week, Prague, Italy, um, and that led me to um, back to to France, where there's a big uh, art foundation looking for uh, uh, ways to solve this this salt issues that they have here, and and going through this, it's it's really interesting to to sort of see the the, the fields where they harvest the the salt. It's it's so beautiful. It's, it's really like this alien landscape with really strange colors, with pink, with the blue sky, with the white salt, and then you know these very straight lines of of the kind of roads on which they they travel. It's uh, super beautiful. And there we try to set up a kind of workshop. So we invited a couple of designers to to join, um, to to think of different ways, also to incorporate this color in, in different objects. And and what's really cool is that we. Here we experimented with uh, uh, a way to mix clays and salt, so a very small percentage of clay with the salt and then baking it in, in a ceramic oven that really creates a, a really waterproof salt material that can be used for tiles for, for quite a lot. And, and this is an experiment where it's still ongoing. It's uh, super exciting. You know, these are kind of rough things, but here on the left, I don't know if you can see it, but it's really a, a nice experiment, especially in the back, to create a waterproof material that is even has the pink of the, the salt in, inside of it. Um, and then finally, uh, another technique we we're, we're started experimenting with about, about two years ago is 3D printing. So these are tiny little salt 3D prints, and that's so started a whole new uh, research basically to figure out how to print with this sort of powder material that is sensitive to water, that is uh, quite fragile, that is uh, quite beautiful also. So, you know, after a lot of tweaking in, in an old printer we had, we came with these, these salt lights. And a cool property of, of salt is that um, if you have a, a fresh uh, salt crystal, it's a... Uh, not white, but it's completely translucent. So it's it's like a glass almost. And you know, because it scratches against each other, it becomes uh, white. But what that means is that it's actually transparent. It's like a translucent material. So when you turn the light on with this thing, you know, you get these super cool transparent uh, uh, light effects. That is really a, a nice property of this material. Um, unfortunately, this lamp is quite fragile because it's 3D printed. It's not very strong, but now, this property is, is really uh, uh, quite amazing. Then the problem is, of course, that the salt ruins your printer, so you have to be a bit careful <laughs> with, the, with the metal parts in it. Um, and this 3D printing is kind of an introduction to the next uh, uh, project uh, I want to talk about. Uh, because it led well, me and my, my partner and, and our team into a whole different uh, direction, because we started you know, we started this 3D printing. We started thinking about different materials as well. Um, and that led about uh, one and a half, two years ago to the founding of a company called Concrete, in which we try to print uh, kind of concrete. Um, because going back to this, this China story, I mean, so almost all of this material is concrete. Um, and, you know, concrete is, is one of the most used materials in the world, actually after water. It's the most used material in the world. It's crazy. So every person each year uses one cubic meter of concrete. Um, that's the amount we're, we're using. Uh, and when you make concrete, uh, a standard you use sand, cement, and water. Cement, the production of cement uses a, a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, and that's, you know, in that way, concrete is responsible for the 5% of global CO2 uh, emissions. So we were like, wow. We're reading into this, uh, uh, researching stuff about it, and uh, we're really looking for a way. Like, wow, what can we do? Uh, how can we work with this material to create, um, you know, with our 3D printing, with the material technology, with the knowledge we have about materials, to create something that's more sustainable, that's less impactful? Um, and at the same time, you know, we were quite frustrated by how concrete is used because it's this sort of beautiful, fluid material that can really take any shape. Uh, and how we use it is the sort of standard, rigid, straight lines, prefabricated architecture that to me as an architect, I mean, this is an actual photo I took in China. It's, it's really boring to me. It's, uh, you know, it's just designing a system and not 
using the properties of these sort of fluid, liquid materials to create unique things. Um, you know, especially when you look at you know what concrete can do, like what what Gaudi can do already a hundred years ago, and and what what um, architects like Zaha Hadid and Gary are doing with with these kind of properties. The problem, of course, why people are not making kind of more fluid, more non-standard shapes and using these properties is that it's just really expensive. Um, no. So those are the problems. It's it's quite polluting. It's it's quite expensive to make something that's not a rigid, standard, straight, flat shape. Um, and our the office we have. I'm from I'm from Rotterdam, uh, a city with a big port in in Holland. And uh, our office is in the port, so every day I take the from my house I cycle a bit, and then I take the boat to the office. And you go with the boat; it's, it's called a water bus. You take the water bus to the office, and you go through the port. And when you go through the port, you see these big hills of, uh, of you know, just rubble. Laying. In this case, fly ashes. Uh, and that led to a whole research about these materials, so industrial byproducts from the metal and the coal industry. Fly ash, slag, metacarlins. And this is a very technical slide, but the, the point is that um, if you make concrete, you use sand, cement, and water. The water reacts with the cement and makes concrete. We're doing something slightly different. So we're using, instead of cement, we're using these byproducts, not activating with water, but with uh, a potassium liquid. Very technical, also very boring, but the point is that by doing that, you can create a, a material that has the properties of concrete, but uses 85% less uh, CO2. So that's really interesting. And by playing with the ingredients, the, what's called a geopolymer in this case, so inorganic polymers, aluminosilicates, in case anyone is into chemistry. Um, but by playing with the ingredients, by playing with the ratios between different powders, you're able to create uh, different colors, different properties, heat resistant, acid resistant materials, super interesting. And and we thought, okay, you know, this is really cool. Maybe we can print this material. You know, it's sustainable, it's cheap, uh, and it's very strong. So what we did is we bought an old uh, uh, 3D printer. We rented a new office. This is quite old, two years ago. And we started printing our first thing. So we had this old printer, started mixing a few powders, mixing inks, and uh, sort of get to a point where we can make this kind of alkaline activated uh, geopolymer material. Uh, so I was playing with colors a bit. And it kind of worked to a certain point. In the back, you see all kinds of failed experiments. Um, it was okay, but it wasn't that good. Like it was quite fragile. It didn't do so well with water. It was, uh, you know, it was not great. And uh, oh yeah, oh, this is the video that fails. So what we realized is that you know the printer we had was an old printer that you used to print gypsum uh, with, and it didn't do what we wanted it to do. Basically, we didn't get the right powder density. We didn't get the right ink properties. Uh, uh, so we thought uh, we had to do our own uh, machine. And how this technology works is that there is a, a machine laying down a, a very thin layer of powder. And then on top of the powder, there's an inkjet system that prints an ink on top of the powder. So you print a kind of section of your model on the powder with the ink. The, the ink reacts with the powder. Uh, and that's how you get your layer. And so you repeat those steps. So at the end, you have a kind of powder box with your object embedded inside. So it's really uh, a sort of collaboration with machine, ink, and powder. Um, and you know, this was really a quite complex uh, uh, thing. So it costs a lot of money. And so to do this, we, we ended up writing, a, we thought we have to get a bit more serious about this. We, we can't just sort of play around in a lab. So we, we took really almost a year to, to write a business plan to, to um, to finance this whole thing, to have a sort of financing strategy. Um, and you know, we designed a prototype for it. That is this prototype. So here you see the, the machine. Uh, and when we built this prototype, only then we could really start, we had to build our own software as well. And only then we could really start to print uh, a kind of geopolymer concrete thing. So that was quite unique. It's the first time 
this was done in, in the world and also something we, we patented. So as a, as a business, it was really a good uh, a milestone. And maybe to show you something, uh, sort of the possibilities of a, of a technology like this, um, this is the city of Palmyra in, in Syria. Uh, it was destroyed by uh, ISIS in 2013, and then the Russians bombed it. The Russians bombed it as well. Um, so the whole sort of ancient Roman city was uh, was destroyed. And um, we collaborated with this this Harvard group called uh, New Palmyra, who uh, they were contacted by the curator of Palmyra, who was actually later abducted by ISIS, who said something: "We have to save this this city." And um, you know, they gathered all old uh, uh, photographs, old drawings of you know these, the Arch of Palmyra and all these beautiful ancient uh, uh, things, and sort of made them into 3D uh, models. And then they came to us to try and make these 3D models into reality. So this is uh, really a, a part of the Arch of Palmyra, and then this is really the only technology to make uh, it's kind of you know. Uh, something that old into a real material, into a stone. And the only other way is to do it in plastic or in a sort of plaster, kind of fragile, not water resistant things. And you know, this is a heavy thing. Uh, and what's interesting is that the material cost for this is only one and a half euro. So, five real. <laughs> um, and what's quite cool is that you're, you can play a bit with the, the, the powder properties to sort of get rid of these normal layers you see in 3D printing. So. You know, it, it really gives you this complete geometric freedom. You can really, um, yeah, well, so you know, you can sort of restore old things, and you can also use it to create completely new kinds of architecture. So when you're completely free in your geometry, you can rethink how we build things, basically. You can think of integrating connections directly into your structure. You can think of integrating uh, a post engine, or electrical ducting, wiring, plumbing. Uh, and just completely new shapes that are right now too expensive to make. So this is a bus stop we're doing in, in Rotterdam. We need some test prints for that. So and we can print in different kinds of uh, colors, different kinds of properties, um, and really any shape. And so what's really cool is that now we have this, uh, we actually managed to get a, a big investment on, on based on this project. So what we're doing now is developing a big version of this printer. So we're uh, in 2019. You know, we we gathered a team. We have some couple of engineers, a chemist, and now we're really making a a big printer, basically that will allow you to print cheap, strong, and very sustainable concrete components in different kinds of materials uh, as well. So, you know, you can buy a printer from us eventually, or do projects with us, um, and that's all still ongoing. But I haven't mentioned your printers. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, if there's any questions, comments, things you you know you want to say, please. How do you how do you avoid the transmigration of the calcarium through the painting? So which painting? Yeah. Uh, suppose you paint uh, a piece like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, when we have, for instance, in a wall, uh, uh, a substrate yeah. with such a calcarium that they transmigrate, they pass through the painting layer. This case. Uh, how do do you avoid this? I mean, you can paint this, no problem. Uh, a normal painting, no, no, nothing special. Yeah. Yeah, it's a stone ultimately, so you can just paint it. It's not the salt. I mean, this is not salt. The salt, yeah, the salt would suck it in, so you just leave it white. No, this is not salt. I thought you, you continue to use salt to, to... No, this is a kind of concrete material. Oh, 
ओके थैंक यू Hi. Um, is there a special tra treatment used on the um, salt 3D printed stuff? Like yeah, the, the 3D printer was quite fragile, so actually we had to, to fix it with a uh, what do you call it, the spray. So if it rains, it just melts. Yeah, the printed stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, it was quite fragile. Yeah, it was more to see the, the sort of cool properties of it. Yeah, but, I uh, expect to see like a salt CDs. Something like yeah, this. the printed stuff. Yeah, it was really cool to to do. Uh, but yeah, like it ruins the machine and it's it's quite fragile. So the 3D printing is is quite tricky to to handle. So you, like you yeah you could do it like lots of epoxy and stuff on it, but it's not so nice. But with the the salt 3D printing, you haven't found a application or no no. We did some lamps and we did some exhibitions, but uh, I, I think it will stay with that. Where uh, and the main thing is that it ruins your printer. <laughs> so you you could do it, but you'd have to really make your own printer for it. That's like plastic and not metal. Thank you. No more, then I think we're done, right? Or one more. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I had a video in the presentation, uh, but it doesn't load. It's really a shame. But so maybe I can show you the, the machine, the one we're having right now. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It's really a shame that this video doesn't load. Um, no, so normal, yeah, exactly. Normal 3D printing is uh, basically uh, a sausage of a material and layering it uh, on top of each other. And, you know, that's how you get also these sort of printed layers. And this machine, let's see. Oh, yeah, so I can show you on, on this thing. So this machine, basically, there's two... Uh, boxes. Here there's a box of powder material and here there's a print platform. And this tool layers a, a thin layer of powder from this machine, from this box onto this box. So they go up and down. And then in here there's an inkjet system. So the inkjet system is similar as in a 2D printer that it prints an ink on a layer. Um, let's see if we can do this. Yeah. So this, these print heads are really just uh, uh, Fujifilm uh, print heads, and they print an ink on top of that thin layer of powder. Let's see if this goes back. Basically, yeah, so it's a chemical reaction between the powder and the ink. Um, so then of when you've printed one layer on top of this, this goes down one step, this goes up one step, you lay another layer of powder, you print another layer of ink. So really at the end of the process, so if this box would be at the bottom, it's full of powder, you get a, a vacuum cleaner, you suck away the powder that didn't harden, where there was no chemical reaction, and you're left with your object. They stick together, yeah. Is that clear at all? Yeah, so that's the one big advantage of this technology is that the powder that does not harden um, supports the powder that did harden. So you can make any kind of geometry, in this case, precision of 100 microns, so 0.1 millimeter. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That was also our frustration with how limited. Like you think when you start to print, you just print anything, but it's it's actually quite limited. So, and this is a, really a way to make uh, a more different kind of geometry. So, with a plastic printer, you wouldn't be able to make those kinds of ornaments. They would look very ugly. Um, and what's quite cool is that we can uh, tweak the powder in such a way that uh, the grain sizes of the powder are the same height as the layers. 
Exactly. So you can't see the printed layers, and that's you know you're able to make smooth surfaces from a printer, and that's also quite unique. You don't get it from a, a plastic printer. Now the chemical reaction is quite uh, specific, so you really have to know what you're doing. Like in theory, you could print anything that sticks. So you could print also sugar or starch or flour. Um, but it won't be strong. Uh, so in this case, it's really a chemical process that makes a, yeah, a stone-like material. So that's that's really the, the IP that we have, is the knowledge of this powder and this ink and the tool that uh, puts them together. No, there's no mold. There's no molds. It's just ink printed on top of powder. So it uh, functions in a way as a 2D printer. It just sort of lowers and adds powder. It's fast. Yeah, it's much quicker than. Uh, so the the ornament, for example, it took four hours to print, uh, and it's about uh, I think it's like three kilos worth of powder, one and a half euros, so five real. Yeah, yeah, this one also four hours. Yeah. So the bigger the printer, the faster it goes. So it, it depends a bit on your layer width and stuff. So with the big printer we're developing now, there's a, a volume uh, about the size of a, a big table. I think kind of similar to the table you're sitting on. That's the size you're going to print. So the full box would take 12 hours. Uh, and then you can print multiple objects inside the box and stuff, so you can really do. Uh, it's quite fast. It's quicker than uh, plastic printing. Okay. I have a question. Um, what materials you replace the cement for? <coughs> Yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. So we're not using any cement. So we're using uh was well, a patented recipe now, but it's uh it's a mix of fly ashes, uh slag, so uh ground granulated blast furnace slag, uh sand and different stuff. No, uh, no part cement. of cement, no 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 cement. So uh compared to regular concrete, the CO two reduction is about eighty five percent. Return to the salt bricks. Uh, um, regarding the um, scratching, uh, what what uh, level of uh, um, it's missing the word dureza superficial the surface dureza superficial dureza superficial hardness. Sorry. Surface hardness of uh, that brick. On like the the Mo scale, I'm I'm not sure. I know the compressive strength is like 25 MPa, but uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure on the surface hardness exact number. Let's see. Uh, you can scratch. It's like similar to. Uh, so uh, if if I build with that such with such a, a brick, and then I paint it accordingly, uh, or paint it, you mentioned. It it uh, survives the the weather. Yeah, it depends a bit on the region you're in. Like I wouldn't put it in a very wet region because then it's it's still salt. So like even if you cover it, it's gonna degrade after a while. So generally, I would only use it in an area where salt is actually an issue. So it's quite a specific material in in this case. So in areas like Israel, the Middle East, uh, dry areas, then mm -hmm. yes. But I wouldn't put it. To be honest, I wouldn't put it in Rio de Janeiro. In the Amazon. Okay. Especially not on the Amazon. I just came from there. It's very wet. <laughs> okay, thank you.
No, it's a. Yeah, yeah. So it's a Portuguese symbol model that you put some thing that's like a blue. Yeah, oh my, it is. It's a composite. Yeah, to make it very strong. Yeah, but it's completely biodegradable. Uh, that's it. So you're, uh, yeah, only a couple percent, and then it becomes quite strong. Hello. In your concrete project, are you able to print an actual reinforced concrete pillar with steel bars inside? No, so we're not able to print the steel inside of it. Um, how we do that, or think we can do that, is because we can print so precise and um, sort of in any shape, is that we can, if you want steel inside of it, you can print tiny little uh, gutters or holes in it and then put cables through them and post-tension them. Okay. It's actually quite an engineering challenge to, to time it, but uh, it's also quite interesting to steer that process. Again, uh, about the geometry that you apply at those um, forms or shapes, is there any gener generative process? You use um, grasshopper, you know, rhinoceros, or something like this, or yeah, like I mean, this is yeah, this is the grasshopper python uh, rhino. But it's not like you don't. It is specific for in this case for the south material, or it's it's not. Um, related to the material? No, the software to us is irrelevant. How you want to generate your forms or design your forms, if you want to use a 3D scan or an algorithm or whatever, I don't mind. Like in our case, I'm familiar with Rhino and Grasshopper, so I use that. Uh, but for the machine, we just need an SDL file and we can print anything. You know, so if you want to use Blender or whatever software, it's also okay. Um, when you did your first experiments that you said it, you, I'm not sure you said uh, a day or so that you have to wait like for the water to dry. Yeah. But when you use the 3D printing, is it like a, an instant chemical reaction or like do you have to use water and, and you have to wait for the water to, to dry? Or That's a good question. So a really, is a really interesting property about, about this material is that you're able to to change the or tweak the curing time, so normal concrete takes you know three days to harden, so it's really unsuitable for three D printing actually. When you when you think about it, and, and in this case we're able to steer it to five to ten minutes of curing time, for you know reasonable strength, and then it cures a bit faster uh, over its lifetime or, or a bit longer over its lifetime. But uh, for this process, it cures quite fast. So basically, when it's done printing, after five minutes you can retrieve it. So it's like a chemical reaction, but at the same time, you have to wait like for some time for it to dry. It's, for it to dry, is that, is that it? In the printing, no. The printing is really, it's just a chemical reaction. There's no drying. Oh. It's really, uh, it's uh, in this case, it's aluminum silicates responding to potassium. And, oh, okay. Uh, okay. you know. <laughs> okay. Comparing with a similar material that this, your material substitute, how would you say about cost? How much is more or less? It's quite an interesting question. So, for example, if you want to make a shape like this, um, if you look at uh, our powder and ink costs more than regular concrete, right? three times more. Um, but we don't have the costs of the mold. We don't have the costs of the labor. Yeah, that's true. So, and the cost of the most, of the cost, the cost of the mold is generally ten times more than the cost of the material, or maybe even more. Sometimes fifty, or sometimes hundred times more. So, in this case, the well, it depends a bit on the shape in that sense. So, if you want to make a straight uh, a wall, or if you want to make this, for example, we will be way more expensive. Mm -hmm. If you want to make this, we are way cheaper. 
you compare with a pl plastic injection, you mean? Well, then it's about series size or batch size. Well, actually, I don't think you can do this with injection molding, but um, if you want a million pieces of this, I would probably cost it. But if you want 500 pieces of this, I would print it. Thank you. No more? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for listening.